starting us off with number 10 is a last minute decision. Now this was shared by Sylvia Kuzman whose grandpa had 3 tickets for the Titanic. Now it was 1911 and rumours about war were rife in Europe and boys as young as 12 were at risk of getting enlisted. So to save himself and his 2 sons, Sylvia's grandpa thought they could start a new life in America. They left Macedonia by train for France and when they got there, her grandpa realised people were willing to spend a lot of money for the white star line tickets that they had. So on a whim he decided to sell them instead and take a different ship the following day. And when they got to Ellis Island the next day they had no idea why everyone was crying so much until they realised this ship they were meant to board the previous day was the Titanic. Coming in at number 9 is the wealth gap. So there were 3 classes of passengers aboard the ship as we already know. First class to third, the riches are in first class and vice versa. The Titanic did a brilliant job of at least making the third class passengers feel more privileged by giving them closed off private rooms as opposed to a dormitory type situation. But the same can't be said about rescue crews who were doing damage control on the ship. In order to prioritise the remains of the first and second class passengers, they literally just started throwing the bodies of third class passengers into the ocean. The evidence was written in excruciating detail in a series of telegrams between the White Star Line and the recovery ship tasked with the issue. So while most of the second and first class passengers bodies were returned to their families and were given proper burials, most of the third class families were kept in the dark about their loved ones. Plot twist, the wage gap didn't get any better. A hundred years later. Spit facts only. At number 8 we have ignored. So the death count of the crash was estimated to be between 1500 to 1635 people out of the 2224 people on board altogether. Now most of them died of hypothermia after the sinking while they were waiting in vain to be rescued from the freezing water. But the casualties could have been so much lower because 20 miles away the SS Californian was floating idle waiting for the ice to clear. I bet they wanted to be them right about then. The captain of the ship even saw all of Titanic crisis flares but ignored them because he assumed they were just simply company rockets. Bruh, I would have come back from the dead just to be like, bro, what the F are you doing bro? We're out here dying. All the SOS signals weren't received till the next day so by the time the Californian dragged its ass there they found nothing but bodies. Too little, too late. Filling on number 7 slot are the tears. Now the commonly believed fact is that the iceberg essentially caused the Titanic to split in half. We saw it in the movie, we saw people sliding to the other side of the ship. It was all happening, and we saw it. Now before actually discovering the wreckage of the ship, experts believe there was only one 300 foot tear in the middle of the ship. Plot twist, it wasn't. But after examining the wreckage, it was a whole other ball game. There were actually six separate tears going through the ship, all totaling 15 feet. But I mean, I had no idea that was a big enough hole to sink a ship that was almost 900 feet long. Almost. 882 nearly there. Now at number 6 is the trusted captain. The captain of the Titanic was Edward Smith and he obviously caught a lot of slack for being the captain of the ship that endured the worst maritime tragedy ever but in reality he wasn't that bad. Smith was one of the most seasoned sea captains out there so much so he even had fans and a low key cult following. Some passengers wouldn't even go on Atlantic voyages unless Smith was the captain of the vessel. So for a captain with that kind of reputation to then go down in history for his folly on the night of the crash is just crazy to me, like mind blown. Coming in at number 5 is the full moon. Now when it comes down to blame, we can blame the lookouts for not doing their job properly, we can blame lack of visibility, but scientists believe the real blame for the tragedy is the moon. Wind causes waves for the most part, but it's the gravitational pull of the sun and moon on earth that causes proper tidal waves. So based on that, researchers have concluded that the full moon on the 4th of January 1912 could have caused the abnormally strong tide tides that move the big iceberg southward right in time to hit the Titanic on her maiden voyage. That was the closest lunar approach the earth had experienced since the year 796 so I feel like they ain't wrong. They ain't wrong. At number 4 is a premonition. So 14 years prior to Titanic's maiden voyage, the author Morgan Robertson wrote a novella called Futility and the subject matter was a sinking ship. That ship was called the Titan and the whole story had eerily similar details to the Titanic. In Futility, Titan is the largest ship of its time and so was the Titanic. In reality, they were both roughly the same size, the Titanic being 25 meters longer and both were described as unsinkable and both hit an iceberg mid-April. Both ships even carried the bare legal minimum number of lifeboats aboard despite having a shit ton of passengers. I mean even the names of both ships are two letters off, like are we just, are we just gonna ignore that? 
I don't actually think we should. Morgan was accused of being psychic, but he replied saying, I know what I'm writing about, that's all. He was an experienced seaman, he knew his subject matter well, and that's all it was. And although I believe Morgan, it's still just very creepy. Filling our number three slot is Till Death Do Us Part. Now, amongst the many important passengers aboard the ship, two of them were Isidore and Ida Strauss, the magnates of Macy's, the department store. As the ship started going down, the attendants were rushing Ida into a lifeboat, but she flat out refused to leave Isidore behind, and Isidore himself refused to leave on a lifeboat and leave any men behind on the ship. So the couple decided to sacrifice themselves and go down together. The last thing she was heard saying was, I will not be separated from my husband as we have lived. Lived, so will we die together. And the last time they were seen was on the deck, arms wrapped around each other in that last embrace. Now that is a real ride or die right there. All your other ride or dies, fake. Cancel it. Done. It's them two. Name a better duo. I'll wait. Now, and number two is the fatal turn. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of what happened and who was contacted when the iceberg was spotted because I feel like we've talked about that part of it to death. Now let me set the scene. When the chief officer on the bridge received that iceberg warning, the first thing he did was tell the hemsman to turn the wheel and that was the biggest mistake he could have made. Researchers who've studied the ship's trajectory have concluded that the collision could have been completely avoided had the order to turn not been made. The Titanic was actually equipped with collision bulkhead in the bow, so had the ship hit the iceberg head on, it would have most likely survived. The damages that would have incurred from the head on impact would have either slowed down the sinking considerably, giving people more time to board lifeboats, or it would have saved the ship entirely. That guy was probably like, I made a grave mistake. And that you have. And finally, at number one is the show must go on. This was just so heartbreaking to me, but I felt like I just had to share it with you guys. I'm sorry if it's a downer. So Dorothy Gibson, a well-known actress at the time, was actually aboard the Titanic and experienced the terrible tragedy for herself. She thankfully survived the incident, but her producers were hounding her to star in a film about the sinking of the Titanic weeks after the crash happened. Like, can we take a moment? Can we take a moment? Dorothy refused to star in Save from the Titanic countless times, but she kept being pressurized into it because producers were convinced that the film would do amazing. The whole thing was shot in a week with Dorothy having multiple breakdowns during filming and having fits of hysterical crying. When it was finally released less than a month after the real event, it did horribly. It bombed. Critics thought it was so insensitive that someone would make a movie about one of the worst maritime tragedies not even a month after it happened. And the fact that Gibson somehow survived filming it was also beyond them. They took too soon to a whole other level. That is way too soon. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them. So imagine my surprise when I found out that wasn't true even in the slightest. It turns out the entire thing could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions on the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. Coming in at number 9 is the unsinkable. Molly Brown was one of the most famous survivors of the Titanic, and after the wreckage she said this while being interviewed, typical brown luck, we're unsinkable. And the woman was courageous, I'll give her that. Crewmen had to rip her away from helping other passengers, and had to physically push her into lifeboat 6. She then started arguing with the quartermaster Robert Hitch who was in charge of the boat. She urged him to turn the hell around and save more passengers because lifeboat 6 was the infamous one that left the ship without even being half full with passengers. What a waste people, but we'll get into that later. At number 8 we have John Jacob Astor. Now this American businessman was the richest passenger aboard the Titanic and rumored to be one of the richest people in the world at that time. His net worth was close to 87 million dollars when he died, which is about 2.3 billion dollars today. Now, despite being a first class passenger and presumed to be snobby, he genuinely wasn't. He safely got his pregnant wife Madeline on a lifeboat and asked if he could get on with her to protect her but was refused. All the women and children had to board before the 
men could. So he got told the number of her lifeboat and waited. As the time finally came and he was about to board the lifeboat, he saw two terrified children on deck and gave up his place on the lifeboat for the two kids. He sacrificed himself, his child's future father, for two helpless children and I think that's pretty damn honourable. Filling Adam's seventh slot is the bacon. Now most passengers who died, died mostly from hypothermia or they drowned, there is a no in between. However the ship's baker Charles Joffin had a different approach in mind. Charles managed to survive in the freezing cold water for over two hours before he was rescued. How did he manage the impossible? Because of all the whiskey he had drunk on the ship before it went down. He claimed he was treading in the water and barely felt the temperature which I feel like great for him but I don't know if I would have been able to survive that and paddle if I was drunk. And it really was a 50-50 because either alcohol can slow your heat loss or it can increase your risk of getting hypothermia so it really was a life or death bargain. I think he was reported saying that he knew he was going to die so he wanted to die drunk. That paid off didn't it Charles? Yes it did. Now at number 6 is collapsible B lifeboat. In a situation like that you can very well imagine how frantic and terrified everyone was from the first emergency bell going off till the very end. The collapsible B was one of the four collapsible boats aboard the Titanic but sadly it was never launched. While the crew was trying to fasten it to the davits it fell off the roof and landed upside down on the boat's deck. The water then washed over that area just as that happened and so collapsible B was being washed away from the ship. But desperate times call for desperate measures. 30 people, mostly crewmen, ended up clinging to life somehow by standing on top of the boat. But on boats like this, I'm just thinking about how all of them would stand on a curved surface like that and survive and not fall in. Coming in at number 5 are the icebergs. Honestly if the Titanic had delayed its maiden voyage by a month or two, I can guarantee it wouldn't have met the tragic demise that it did. April 1912 saw 300 plus icebergs in the North Atlantic shipping lanes which was the highest number seen within this route in over half a century. The high influx of icebergs was due to the fact that winter that year was warmer than usual, hence more ice was getting dislodged and thus more icebergs were travelling towards that route. Talk about wrong place, wrong time. At number 4 are the engineers. Thanks to the dedicated Scottish and British engineers aboard the ship, a lot of people were saved that actually wouldn't have been. The men stayed behind and worked effortlessly until the ship actually went under. None of the lights on the ship went out until it was fully underwater. The men spent the whole time keeping the pumps running and the electricity going which helped the crew get the passengers on the lifeboats. Lights aside, they also kept the radio running which sent out distress signals up until a few minutes before the ship was submerged. One of the last signals heard by the Carpathia was engine room full up to boilers aka flood of water. Out of the 25 engineers, not a single one survived. If anyone was a real MVP on this boat, it was definitely the 25 men right there. Filling at number 3 slot is watertight. Now designs of the Titanic would make you think the fleet was airtight. It had a double bottom as well as 15 watertight bulkhead compartments that were equipped with further watertight doors. That's a lot of me saying watertight, doesn't it? So with all those extra precautions in place, what the hell went wrong besides the big tears in the ship's Side. Well, it turns out the walls separating the bulkheads allowed water to get in from one compartment to another, hence the foolproof design ended up having a pretty huge fatal flaw. Now at number 2 are furry friends. People dying is sad of course, but pets dying is even sadder for some reason. First class passengers aboard the Titanic were allowed to bring their dogs while on board and so there were about 12 confirmed dogs on the ship. Of those 12, only 3 got a happy ending as they were smuggled onto lifeboats and taken to New York. The rest sadly drowned with the rest of the passengers. And finally at number 1 is the survival rate. Now this one triggered me. Iceberg or no iceberg, if anything happened to the Titanic, there was no way everyone was going to survive. If anything, they actually ensured that there'd be no conceivable way that everyone aboard would survive. 2,224 people were aboard that ship and despite having 16 lifeboat davits that could each lower 3 boats, making the total 48. The Titanic only carried 20 lifeboats and 4 of those were collapsed which ended up being problematic as hell and very hard to launch as I mentioned with collapsible B. Each lifeboat had the capacity to hold 65 people and the collapsible ones were able to hold 47. Now let's do some quick maths yeah? If at full capacity the normal lifeboats could have saved 1,300 passengers while the collapsible ones could have saved 188 passengers. Now best case scenario at full capacity nothing going wrong, that still leaves 736 people dead. We know getting collapsible A and B was a sh 
show, so honestly, this was built in death. Starting us off at number 10 are the Navitro brothers, aka the Titanic orphans. This one is equally sad and equally scandalous. Michelle Jr. and Edmund Navratil were going through a rough time for any three and two year olds. Their parents separated in 1912, and their mum Marcel had full custody of them, but would let their dad Michelle see them on weekends. When she went to pick up the boys after Easter weekend, she found the house empty and the boys nowhere to be found. What happened was that Michelle kidnapped the boys and boarded the Titanic, wanting to immigrate to the US and start a new chapter with his kids and genuinely hoping his ex wife would follow. I mean, if you want your ex wife to follow, I feel like kidnapping is not the best start. The three came on as second class passengers with fake names, Michelle as Lewis M. Hoffman and the boys as Lola and Momin. When the ship was going down, Michelle put his kids in collapsible boat D and sadly did not survive himself. Since the boys were young and spoke no English whatsoever, they couldn't identify themselves either and were dubbed the Titanic orphans until their mother was finally located. They were the only children that survived the Titanic that were rescued without a parent or guardian present. Can you just imagine the trauma they went through that they will possibly pretty much never get over. That's a lifelong trauma. In our number 9 spot today we have the futility. This is more so something that happened prior to the fateful day of the Titanic sinking, but it's still quite unsettling and also kind of bizarre nonetheless. In 1898 a book called Futility was released by an author named Morgan Robertson. This book tells the story of a large ship named the Titan. The Titan sets out for its first sail but encounters and strikes an iceberg. This certainly sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Considering this book was released in 1898 and the real life event of the Titanic sinking happened in 1912, there are many people who believe that this novel predicted this fateful day. It's most likely a very strange coincidence, but man is it really weird. Even with the names being so close, let alone how the rest of the story just matches up so well. Maybe Morgan Robertson is a time traveler or some kind of prophet, but if he was to guess it would be kind of rude to just write a book about it rather than, I don't know, warn someone? In our number 8 spot today we have True Love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ship started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida however refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said quote, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just such a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that they had one another in those very frightening moments. In our number 7 spot today we have Take My Spot. John Jacob Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that day. As the ship was sinking, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he saw two absolutely terrified children standing behind him. He instead gave up his spot and let those two children on the boat, which is both noble but it's also just the right thing to do. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news is that both his wife and the child she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and survive the whole ordeal, which also likely means that the children he gave his spot up for also survived. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also hear quite a few about the bravery people showed during this tragic event. In our number 6 spot today we have the lifeboat. Before the Titanic set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we are talking about the safety of the 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats boats ended up being reduced to just 20 with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This meant that, should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. 
And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply were just not up to par. In our number 5 spot today, we have the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. This may seem like a mundane find, but it revealed a very grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card showed that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. There clearly is no way anyone could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation all around. In our number four spot today, we have slow action. While we were just talking about lifeboats, I mentioned how there wasn't enough time to launch all of the ones on board. This is true, and while the Titanic sank fairly quickly, there would have been more time if only people were more prepared. What I mean is that from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. This means that there are likely many lives that could have been saved had they had some more direction or prior training. In our number 3 spot today, we have ignored help. Only 20 miles away from the location of the sinking of the Titanic was another boat called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, which was clearly a fantastic idea. What is pretty insane, however, is that the captain of the this boat actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic, but he ignored them because he figured they were company rockets. And to make this matter even worse, the SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't even received until the next day because the radio operator on the SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, everyone had unfortunately already passed away and they weren't able to save anyone. Who knows what could have happened had they taken those emergency signals seriously? It's obviously not their fault, but it definitely makes you think. In our number two spot today, we have the band. We know how passionate musicians can be, and we know how healing music is for a lot of people. While I am absolutely sure that there was nothing that could be done to completely erase people's worries about what was going on, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up, I'm sure for other passengers as well as themselves. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that would still have been insanely brave of them, but as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passenger to leave but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad that their acts have been remembered even still. In our number one spot today, we have Wrong Turn. Okay, so we talked about how many warnings about the iceberg were ignored, but what happened when people finally stopped ignoring them? Well, once the iceberg was actually spotted, the chief officer received this warning and he ordered the helmsman to turn the wheel. Apparently this was actually a huge mistake, but it's unlikely they would have known that at the time. Researchers now believe that if they hadn't turned the wheel, the ship might not have sunk. The ship itself had bulkheads in the bow, so it is very likely that had the ship collided head on with the iceberg, it actually would have been fine. They said that a head on collision would have either stopped the ship from sinking at all, or it would have at least sunk a lot more slowly, which would have given more time for people to be rescued. It's easy for us to look back and say this would have been the best move, but under that kind of pressure, it's tough to see things as clearly as we can right now. Thank you.